All right. Good morning, folks. I see a uh, number of uh, familiar faces in the audiences. And whoever has the mic on, please turn it off so I don't reverberate between what your mic picks up and what I say. So, I wanted to give an overview of some of the connections between weather models, climate models, observations, and in a sense, parallel Earths. Um, there are differences and there are components that are shared um, among the um, different models. And we live on a fairly complex um, Earth. Um, both weather models and um, uh, climate models uh, have to have radiation transport. Uh, that's solar radiation, UV to near-infrared, coming down to, through the atmosphere to the surface. And um, atmospheric or terrestrial infrared radiation um, going through the atmosphere, getting absorbed, and finally part of it getting radiated out to space. Um, among processes important to both, but in slightly different ways, um, we have evaporation of water, heat exchange at the ocean surface or the land surface. Um, and over here, we have um, biological processes. Uh, interacting with the at atmosphere. Um, so in both um, climate models and weather models, um, these processes are included, but um, in slightly different ways. And the reason they're included in slight different, slightly different ways is the difference in time scales. First off, we can't numerically model the planet um, in a continual a continuum basis, which means we have to chop up the Earth horizontally into cells, and then on top of each horizontal cell, like an icosahedral, or down here what's called a cubed sphere, we have to add vertical layers. So the horizontal gridding and the vertical layering gives us a 3D grid. And it's that 3D grid on which any numerical model operates. And by the way, um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, and hopefully, I'm audible. <laughs> now, the natural grid um, has been the latitude and longitude grid, but um, that has a big problem around the poles in that the longitude lines all come together at the pole, so the distance from longitude line to longitude line decreases as we approach the pole and finally goes to zero. I mean, at the pole, we could go around the world just by turning our body around in place. On this grid, um, we want to model the atmosphere, and we want to use algorithms that um, 
conserve mass um, and energy uh, as it moves heat and um, air around. And it moves air around because of pressure differences. Um, these days, there's a new emphasis on having a grid and algorithms for parallel computing. And as we move toward exascale computing, that becomes even more stringent. Uh, exascale being a billion, billion floating point operations per second. Yes, Vic. Um, to answer your, your question, the, the grid extends upwards um, with cells above the ones below. Um, it doesn't, the distance upwards isn't as large because we don't go 6,000 kilometers up, but um, we do have to have multiple vertical layers because the atmosphere. Um, these days, into the stratosphere. Um, it used to be climate models only went up into the um, through the troposphere, but uh, it's been learned that stratospheric processes in chemistry are important. And the stratosphere starts at about 15 kilometers near the pole or near the. Uh, equator and about eight kilometers closer to the poles. Probably higher than 20 kilometers. Well, the icosahedral um, model can also be thought of as um, a hexagonal grid because the, uh, the triangles in the icosahedral model uh, do make up hexagons. Um, so yes, that, that is equal area. The um, cube on a sphere, um, I believe, is not entirely equal area and, and there are boundaries at the edge um, of the cube part on each face. But both of them get away from having a, a singular pole. Um, the grid elements are numbered. Um, I can't immediately dredge up how they're numbered, but they're, um, there is a reference system for any grid. So, as we, um, as we increase the resolution and go to larger problems. Um, with the 3D grid, if you um, double the resolution, um, basically you have eight times as many calculations. Um, and what, um, what it's turning out is that moving data in memory or um, between CPUs becomes much more expensive than the actual um, computing. So moving to exascale computing means changing algorithms and understanding a lot more about data boom movement and trying to minimize it and um, uh, moving away from some of the old paradigms. One difference between climate models and numerical weather prediction models, NWP, um, 
is that the climate model has more coarse, um, also known as less resolution. Um, the difference is something like a base resolution of 12 kilometers um, for the climate models, or for the weather prediction models horizontally, and more like 30 uh, kilometers for the climate models. And the weather prediction models may have some areas with greater resolution um, that are run nested within um, its main grid to make a more for, uh, accurate forecast at certain places. Yes, the climate models to um, do with, go with Syzygy's question um, predict atmosphere conditions but not in the same sense as a weather model, and I'll be getting into that. So to run a weather model, um, it needs good input, um, a best estimate of the current state of the atmosphere and ocean surface. And uh, the process of taking all those observations and getting them onto the model grid is known as assimilation. Um, and that's a necessary step before the prediction can begin. Um, the data I've listed here and um, some of these resources are listed on the note card so you can uh, look in more detail or weather stations, ship reports, ocean boys, um, autonomous ocean boys these days that um, um, only require occasional servicing. And one of the problems with the um, current pandemic is people haven't been able to go out in ships and service them. So um, there are lots of side effects that people might not think of immediately. And if the ocean boys start going out, then the forecasts become um, less accurate. And terrain, G said. And in your note card, there's a link to the uh, um, shuttle radar topography um, data, which Actually, data like that, um, in the past, they've actually brought some into Second Life um, to uh, do the topography of a whole sim. So it's possible to take real-life topography um, and scale it correctly and bring it into Second Life. Um, land cover, um, there's several decades now of Landsat data, um, which includes images of different surface types and analysis from that. Um, radio suns, these are weather balloons carrying inst uh, sort of um, expendable um, radio packages beneath them. And one of the ways of getting um, data um, profiles, vertical profiles through the atmosphere is to launch a radio sound um, up through the atmosphere. It's a local measurement, but it does give you that uh, important vertical profile. And satellite data. And satellite data has a relationship to the modeling because it also requires a similar radiative transfer model to retrieve um, chemical compounds and temperature from what the satellite up above the atmosphere sees. Yes, LIDAR, um, when the LIDAR is another instrument, um, it's been used both ground-based um, 
and from satellites to detect um, dust and aerosol particles. So what in the, the uh, oh, and I have a, a uh, ocean boy, one of the newer ocean boys pictured here. Uh, what the model does is take differential equations. And this is taking atmospheric equations or equations of uh, fluid flow and uh, that um, are written in terms of small changes or infinitesimal changes. And um, moving them forward in time, and that moving forward is called integrating in time. Um, so you have the fluid flow dynamics, uh, a whole um, domain of research on fluid dynamics there, thermodynamics, which is the treatment of heat exchange, um, change in temperature with pressure, uh, I think most of us have um, sprayed a compressed air can into a computer to remove dust. If you haven't, you probably should. Um, and notice that after a few sprays, the can is cooled down. And this is because the air and expanding is doing work and that work comes at the expense of temperature. So as air rises in the atmosphere, um, it'll cool. And that's part of the thermodynamics. Uh, processes of evaporation um, and convection that move air up from the surface and um, include formation of clouds when the uh, air has enough moisture that it cools to its dew point and then the um, water vapor condenses and releases more heat which allows the parcel to go up higher um, and as i mentioned the transport of sunlight and infrared radiation through the atmosphere which is common to weather models, climate models, and um, retrieving data, re retrieving um, properties of the atmosphere from satellite observations. What the satellite sees is just the um, infrared radiation, for example, at the top of the atmosphere in multiple wavelengths. As Shiloh mentioned, um, including the influence of uh, biological release of methane um, from agricultural fields, from uh, feedlots. Um, I'll get to that in a, uh, a moment. And one of the resources on that note card is FlexNet, which goes in and just uh, does just that. And on the uh, website for this talk, one of the pictures, which I don't actually have in the talk, is of a uh, tower to measure such fluxes of gases from a surface. For numerical weather prediction, the atmosphere has limited predictability. And the theoretical limit has been determined to be about 14 days. Um, you never have perfect initial conditions, and the model is an approximation. 
and probably the current practical predictability is six to ten days and some features can have significantly shorter predictability so predictability isn't always just that six to ten days and I give an example on the next slide um, since the 1990s weather prediction has gone from what was previously done was single runs of a weather model and basically that was the basis for the forecast since the 1990s the prediction is used ensembles of runs this means maybe a hundred runs of the model and um, the initial conditions meaning everything on the current state of the atmosphere and some of the parameters within the model um, are varied so parameters generally come because on a 30 kilometer grid you don't resolve turbulent diffusion you don't resolve um, evaporation and then recondensation on the surface molecule by molecule with a, a net flow so and individual cumulus clouds aren't resolvable either so um, there is a collection of parameterizations which means um, approximations of the um, some of the individual effects over the size of a model grid and these and these generally have parameters that have probability distributions in themselves and uh, the parameters are basically determined by observations so every every individual submodule gets looked at and determined and um, um, checked out how it um, compares with observations in setting the parameter values but um, because the parameters have some uncertainty uh, in making these ensemble runs some of these parameters will be uh, varied which means sampling from their probability distribution I don't know if that makes sense but um, and then the ensembles are further improved by using multiple models um, since different models created by um, different groups will um, be doing these parameterizations in slightly different ways so it helps expand the um, um, evaluation of the uncertainty and it turns out that different places are using their own sort of weighted ensembles of different uh, models like Florida State has one for uh, looking at tropical storms that's a, a weighted average so I mentioned that I'd give an example of where predictability failed I mean just pretty much totally Um, during 15 to 16 October 1987 a violent storm tore into southern England um, Steve Esterbrook um, in reviewing a talk by Tim uh, Palmer noted that the town of Seven Oaks where he used to live became uh, the town of No Oaks uh, the wind was that strong um, caused a number of deaths and um, billions of dollars of damage um, I have several links in that note card on the, the great storm of 1987 um, 
early forecasts had indicated there might be a storm, and then later forecasts missed it. And this was before ensemble modeling, so it was um, um, single runs of the mo uh, current models to predict the weather. Um, one of the problems, there was a lack of observations offshore in the Atlantic. So the forecast basically said um, there'll be strong winds, but um, the real storm will be um, south of England. Um, that um, the real storm tore into both uh, France and the south of England. Um, years later, probably in the 90s, when they uh, or early 2000s, um, there was a reanalysis or reprediction using uh, ensemble talk. <coughs> Sorry, technology, and a few of the runs, I think there was something like a hundred runs, uh, a few of the runs showed the severe storm, and the conclusion was the storm was simply um, very difficult to uh, uh, predict. Um, current technology would include it as a possibility, but both the observations and the uh, technology back then didn't exist, back in 1987. So what happens when we reach the end of pre predictability in a numerical weather model? Um, does the model weather and observed weather diverge? Diverge means separate, go their own ways. It's um, sort of like a divorce. And yes, uh, you're no longer um, able to predict whether <clears throat> next Saturday will be a good picnic day. Does the model produce garbage? Um, Definitely not. It it uh, keeps on producing looks, what looks like um, reasonable weather, and since a, a numerical prediction model doesn't have to include seasonality, it sort of like continues on as a weather of a single month. But a person on a parallel Earth, see there there we get to parallel Earth, with a model's weather couldn't tell from just the weather that, uh, that they experience, that they are not on our Earth. Yes, it's different weather, but it's valid weather. Yes, Vic, weather is a, a two-week term at most. Uh, climate is long-term and generally taken to be um, 30 years. And Part of the reason for the 30 years is that the models produce features like El Nino or ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Um, they don't produce those features um, at the same time that the Earth might produce them, uh, but they do produce them with the right statistics. So. Because of ocean time scales, it takes about 30 years to determine the climate. That's why um, during a strong El Nino, um, skeptics sort of looked at the model result and said, well, the model result isn't doing this. And that's because um, climate models are not tracking these ocean oscillations in the same time as the Earth, but they produce them. I have a couple talks in that um, note card that show uh, model patterns uh, that are emergent phenomena of the model. And uh, one by, uh, the one by Steve Easterbrook uh, 
um, shows model patterns and uh, observed patterns at the same time. And so they're not identical because um, even though they might be at the same you know, year time, um, the climate model is more like a parallel Earth. So, <clears throat> so um, as we move to um, th that last bit about what happens when we run a weather model longer than the two weeks is a step toward climate modeling. So what's different about a climate model? Um, now we're doing the ensemble runs for 30 years each rather than two weeks or up to 100 years. Um, we generally have less resolution on the horizontal grid, which also ties into less resolution on the vertical uh, grid. Um, 30 kilometers resolution instead of 12 or less. Um, we now have to include the seasonal cycle. Um, since the Earth, as it orbits around the sun, um, has summer at the North Pole and South Pole at different times. And also the distance um, of the Earth from the Sun changes slightly. We're, we're basically at a approaching an eccentricity, which is the how the orbit differs from being circular. Uh, we're approaching a, a minimum in about 2,000 years, and the current eccentricity is, is historically small. Um, instead of the land and ocean surface just affecting the atmosphere, we now have to consider the way that the atmosphere affects the um, land surface coverage and the ocean. So there's a new feedback that um, the model now has to consider melting ice, uh, changing plant coverage, um, changing moisture patterns. Shadow, um, numerical weather prediction um, only goes out two weeks, so the concentration of CO2 um, is not going to be changing appreciably um, in that two weeks. Um, but as model runs are updated over time, the concentration of CO2 has to be updated uh, correspondingly. Um, in climate modeling, we're generally looking at a scenario for trace gas emission. This includes CO2 and methane. Um, but the dynamical core radiation transport models and um, noise processes, this is evaporation, um, cumulus convection, um, we basically can inherit from a numerical weather prediction model. So, you know, if they're working in the numerical weather prediction, they're going to work in the climate model. In fact, it's easier because the resolution um, is less fine. As you, it, when it gets down below 10 kilometers resolution, um, there's some additional considerations that come in and how things are treated. 
Nick for a uh, for a global model. There aren't any edges. If you're running nested um, limited region models, there are edges, and basically the edges are handled by the um, uh, less resolved global model. And how do we know it works? Well, the radiation transport models are used both in the numerical weather prediction models, which are, you know, within predictability are successful, and are used in satellite retrievals. And the satellite retrievals um, use radio signs and local measurements um, to determine the ac their accuracy. Um, so locally measuring to um, calibrate the radiation transfer uh, model, and we know that works. Um, satellite retrievals have been validated by local measurements. Um, Submodules in a climate model are compared with observations, and I've included um, the in the uh, note card uh, links to ARM, which is the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program that was um, started in 1989, uh, specifically to um, take um, coincident measures of atmospheric properties, moisture, clouds, um, at multiple sites around the world, along with the measurements of the sunlight and infrared radiation. So that program has been used to look at model treatments uh, and parameterizations within climate models. Um, another source of observations that's important um, is the biological uh, fluxes of gases like methane and CO2 um, from agricultural fields, uh, from feedlots, and um, that, uh, to cover that, I've included a link to uh, FlexNet, and then more recently an ecological um, monitoring system called NEON. Um, for the total model, um, there is statistical analysis of the model output, comparison of model um, control run statistics with observed statistics. Uh, does it capture the, um, the rainfall patterns right and the seasonal temperature patterns? Um, is evaporating the right um, uh, amount of moisture. So um, the models are um, validated in a sense both locally in the subprocesses and by looking at the um, overall statistics of output runs. And finally there's a process of um, model inner comparisons, um, sort of a, a bake-off um, called CMIP, climate model in comparison, and I forget what the P is. So observation sets, they've been mentioning, mentioning them um, on the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program um, with the um, 
co-located measurements of atmospheric properties and how they affect the sunlight and infrared radiation transport. FluxNet field measurements of biological sources and sinks of gases. These are people going out into the field, um, building measurement towers, climbing up in the tropics into plant canopies, um, and taking measurements up there. Uh, that's something recently about, you know, it took an hour to climb into the canopy to do the, the measurements. I um, also had a story um, uh, told at a conference of uh, a scientist getting an early morning phone call that, to rescue his instruments because they turned on the sprinklers. So he was out there in the field taking out the instruments while getting sprinkled with um, reclaimed brown water. Um, we now have um, autonomous ocean buoys um, that can measure temperature and CO2 on floating, uh, floating platforms. And Landsat, um, for um, surface type characteristics, plus there's a whole um, NASA has an Earth Observing System, EOS, uh, that measures various properties of the atmosphere. So these are your um, satellite measurements. I didn't, don't think I included that on the resource card, but I probably should have. So um, Earth Observing System. So, in summary, weather prediction is an initial value problem, meaning it depends very, very strongly on the current state of the atmosphere given it um, at the beginning of a prediction. Um, and the prediction, because of the sensitivity, nonlinearity of the equation, has a limited range. Um, into the future uh, before it diverges from what's going on in the Earth. In contrast, climate models um, don't care terribly about um, their initial conditions. They're run until, um, spun up is the word used, until basically the initial conditions don't matter anymore and it's an energy input and distribution problem what's known as a boundary value problem so um, it's solving a different type of problem uh, it's still producing what looks like weather um, there hasn't been a way found uh, other than running a continual stream of weather prediction and looking at the statistics and looking at where the model goes to do that. So then one looks at the long-term average of um, such weather in the climate. Both type of models are now done using ensembles of runs as well as runs by multiple models. Um, and I hear these or actually read them on my uh, NOAA forecast op app on my phone when I look at the forecast discussion. The uh, forecaster will mention specific models and, you know, this one seems to uh, predict, like ECMWF is predicting um, slightly warmer weather at the 850 millibar level. Um, there are both differences and shared components between the models. And the shared components, in a sense, help validate the uh, physics that's gone into the models. Um, when we're modeling subgrid processes, those are partly from theory. Um, for instance, evaporation depends on the wind speed. Um, and 
a um, saturated water uh, vapor differences between the surface and the first atmospheric layer. So including those theoretical concepts with a constant which itself has a probability distribution. So modeling of subgrid processes are partly from theory and partly from um, comparison with observations. And that's the talk. And as far as other hard to predict um, storms that are missed in forecasts, um, you know, I'd have to look at the specifics and I haven't. No, I don't think uh, weather models include earthquakes. Oh, chaos theory. Well, it's chaos theory. Um, Ed Lorentz uh, did a lot of the early work on this um, that limits the predictability of, of range and numerical weather prediction. It's the, the property that initially close initial conditions uh, don't stay close or don't have to stay close. And um, after a while, go off on totally different paths. And uh, that's where I use the concept of parallel Earths. There's been modeling of um, other planets. Um, Jim Pollock, um, no longer living, um, and uh, Carl Sagan did some atmospheric uh, modeling of other planets. Basically, the climate model is operating within the um, strange attractor, which basically means that the weather doesn't just go off into something unreasonable. It's not like extrapolating a polynomial outside of its range of fitting, where you know it may look fine um, 
within the original data range, but go outside it and uh, you get really strange stuff, meaningless stuff. A, a climate model um, is staying within an envelope, uh, even though model runs with different initial conditions or slightly different parameters um, won't have the same weather in the same place at the same time. So we're basically um, taking an ensemble model, taking tours around the strange attractor. Yes. Tag, um, you're reading something um, that in some ways the acceptance of the disinformation has little to do with actual climate and more um, attachment to what people consider their way of life. Um, and, of course, now it's also become sort of a political identity. Um, and simply correcting information um, without having become a trusted source of information does, um, it just doesn't work. Um, yes, identity politics. Um, you know, what's sad is people are going to discover further on that uh, the science was right after all. In some ways, the um, COVID-19 pandemic is climate science on the short term because we've reached a situation where epidemiologists and healthcare practitioners give information that gets contradicted uh, by people who don't have the expertise and are believed and you know those chickens are going to come home to roost uh, because the virus basically doesn't care um, you can infect people before um, you show any symptoms which is one of the difficulties with the virus so you can't wait to uh, quarantine people until they know they're sick um, if the virus can infect more than one person, say two people, then it doubles sort of every infection period, the, the number of cases, um, until everybody has either had it or died. Um, part of the sheltering in place um, is to give time, but also um, an infected person has a limited time during which they're going to stay infected and once that they're no longer infectious if they haven't infected anybody you're on the way to killing off an outbreak so there's science there and there's baloney just as there is in um, dealing with climate science <laughs> 
science is just used to get funding for doing climate science, uh, there are a lot easier ways to make money than uh, trying to do it by writing um, climate research graphs. It, it takes a lot of de um, dedication to do that because for any proposal written except for for very well-known people, your chances of getting funding are like 10%. Um, so, um, plus the idea that thousands of scientists are um, all able to have a conspiracy plot together. Uh, you know, scientists tend to be kind of individualistic. If millions die, um, it is as much um, human action as anything else. Um, there's the old saying that God helps those who help themselves, and I think the inverse is true, too, that um, um, why rescue those who are um, insisting on willful ignorance and um, not in touch with reality. Um, as far as viruses go, both pigs and bats have lowered immune systems, uh, which means they can um, exist as carriers of viruses without becoming um, all that sick. Um, and with the current COVID virus, it's thought that it was carried in bats and transferred into another animal, possibly a pangolin, before transferring into humans. Um, you know, sometimes we're finding new viruses because we've pushed into um, natural terrain that we weren't in before. And there are species that um, are carriers of the virus. And viruses mutate regularly, so it's a matter of time before they um, manage to infect humans. Selling science, I mean, is, is hard work because people make um, a lot of decisions by intuition or gut feelings rather than rationally. Oh, there are programs like that, says she, that, um, you know, get your science. Um, NASA has had some, um, there's an organization of science educators who work to ensure that proper science is taught. Yeah, stack. Um, Brokers tend to look at risk assessment as to um, insurance agencies, and so you ha do have concern about uh, sea level rise. 
the military also um, has tended to um, look at um, climate change as a risk increaser. Yes, some of um, Dan uh, Kahneman um, and his book and has done a um, has a lecture that's on a line on thinking fast and slow. Um, um, yep, um, is a classic um, in influencing people in a sense that. Um, you have to build trust and unfortunately people are trusting um, those who don't have their best interests in mind. Well, thank you all for coming and participating and commenting and asking questions. And um, do use the resource note card if you um, want to look at things further. The uh, two TED Talks at the top of it are, uh, you know, some great summaries. Um, um, Gavin Schmidt makes the uh, point that models have skill, and um, that's the real bottom line. Not that models are correct, because in this um, venue of atmospheric modeling, um, you're never going to be correct in the sense of an engineering, a fixed engineering problem. But it is important that a model have skill and give you information that you didn't have before, which is what's happening. Anyway, it's nice to see you here.